Hello, story lovers, and welcome or welcome back to my channel, Tales with Tasha. I am Tasha and I am a storyteller. I love stories and I hope you will enjoy mine as much as I do. Today's story is another reimagined fairy tale to complete this week's theme of Cabin in the Woods. It is a darker version of Little Red Riding Hood, although we have to admit the original is not exactly all sweetness and light. For this tale we have werewolves and vengeance. Don't forget to let me know your favourite genres stroke themes in the comments so I can make sure to have you covered in the new year planning. Please subscribe to support the channel. For those new to YouTube, it's free. And also, smash that like button if you enjoy the tale. Thank you, lovelies. This story is what I would define as 12A-ish, not suitable for younger viewers because of its darker leanings. With that being said, make sure you are sitting comfortably, and let's jump right on in. Red Wolf Spain, Daggers of Vengeance, a darker take on Little Red Riding Hood, by Natasha Duncan Drake. The girl smells like the woods on a spring day, bright and clean with blossoms in full bloom. Her scent draws you closer, almost familiar. But you sniff out an edge that stings. It is well hidden, but no wolf worthy of the name could miss wolfsbane in their nostrils. Hang back, your instincts scream. Circle round, teach her a lesson, whispers your pride. A hunter alone in your woods must be a fool. No human ventures here by themselves, except for the batty old biddy who lives in the cottage. She minds her own business, and your pack does the same. You want no trouble from humans, but hunters are a different matter. Your alpha will not tolerate that, not after last time. The girl is easy to follow, the red of her coat flashing through the trees. Something about her tickles the back of your mind, an elusive thought. It must be a trick of memory. She strides confidently, hood drawn over dark hair that escapes its confines in haphazard curls. You should go and report, but she has you fascinated. She moves like a predator. She is also nearing the pack's central territory. All the woods are pack lands, but no one may enter the home area without direct permission. Only two people have that from your alpha that you know of, the local police commissioner and the mayor, and then only on official business. Your alpha has forbidden all contact with humans except when absolutely necessary, and no wolf will disobey their alpha. If the girl walks past the trespassing markers, you know there will be trouble of the worst kind. An average human would be bad enough, they would be scared off, but a hunter will not survive. Your alpha has given the pack a kill order for all hunters unless they come under a flag of truce in the old forms. This girl has none of the signs. She doesn't even look like a hunter. The red coat, blue jeans, sturdy boots, all make her look like an average human out for a walk. But that smell, there is no escaping that smell. Only hunters carry wolfsbane. What few laws there are to protect werewolves make it illegal for anyone without a license to own it. The scent is faint. She might not have any on her now as she masquerades as a helpless girl, but to a wolf's nose, wolfsbane fades very, very slowly. You are particularly sensitive to it, have been ever since you saw your father's body scattered with the dried powder. 
Your blood boils as the breeze brings that scent to you again. The arrogance alone and the disrespect urge you to attack. Keeping your wolf in check, you follow silently, watching and waiting to see what will happen. You almost hope she does step into the home grounds. Then you will have cause to take her down. Your alpha will reprimand you if you do, but you've been dealing with this anger for years. A hunter giving you a valid reason for revenge is a rare thing. It is hard to keep down the disappointed growl as the girl stops, just before the markers. She does not turn, does not even look around, just cocks her head for a moment, almost as if she was a wolf herself. I know you're there, she says, surprising you. Please tell Marla I am here to see her. That voice. You know that voice. Yet, where from will not become clear in your mind. Your instincts scream that this must be a trap, a hunter's game. But the spark of recognition will not let you go. You should slip away, call the others. But you can't. You step out onto the path behind her. The complete calm of her voice, her apparently total lack of fear, clouds your judgment with anger. Why should I tell my alpha about a lone hunter? She turns, half her face shadowed by the hood. For a moment, she is still. Ravan? With a flick of her head, her hood falls back. Recognition hits you like the moon's pull. Cecily? The face is older, but those eyes have never left you, yet it makes no sense. You smell like a hunter. She pulls at her belt buckle, slides it free, holding it out. There, in a neat row, are six daggers, each with a lock of hair braided onto the hilt. The head of a wolf is carved on every pommel. They are hunter's daggers. Every hunter carries one, supposedly as a way to identify themselves. But they have identification just like police officers. Every wolf knows the daggers are carried as a threat. You cannot understand why Cecily would have six, or any at all. Most call me Red now, she says. These are for you and your mother, one from each of them. For a moment you are confused, then it hits you. There were six hunters on the day that changed your life forever. They're all dead, Cecily adds, every one of them who killed your father. You cannot breathe as memory hits you like a train, you recall the little girl who cried, your friend who screamed when your mother, as your alpha, ordered you never to talk to humans again. It had been a miracle your pack had not gone rogue when your father, the then alpha, had been murdered. That's what they had wanted. But your mother had taken the power, strong enough to control the others. Human justice had done nothing. The hunters had used the flimsy excuse of chasing a wolf wanted for murder into the woods and mistaking your father for him as your father protected Cecily from the strangers. It had been enough to get them off with a fine. Only your mother's strength had stopped the beaters seeking the revenge that would have brought more killers down on the pack. I knew you couldn't go after them, Cecily says, so I did it for you. You take a breath. Won't they come for you? I'm human, she says. No one would ever suspect me. She smiles a crooked smile. I left a calling card, but they will never connect it to me, and now hunters know there is someone who will avenge those they have wronged, she tells you. That's what friends are for. You have the sudden urge to laugh hysterically. You loved her back then, with all the innocence of children. You met by chance as she visited her grandmother in the cottage in the woods. 
and you used to sneak back whenever she was there. It was your fault your father was there that day looking for you. You don't know what plan the hunters had had, but they had used your foolishness to trap your father. You've never told your mother that it was more than simple friendship that kept bringing you back, that even then, so young, you had felt something more when you played hide-and-seek in the woods with Cecily. You hadn't understood it then, but you feel it again now. It pulses through you with a clarity your childhood self could never have understood. The wolf in you surges to the surface, and you barely catch it. You know your eyes must have flashed werewolf gold, maybe even red, because your vision changed for a fleeting second. I know, Cecily says before you can speak. It took me a long time to figure it out too. You almost lose control completely then. However, common sense tempers your reaction. How could she know what you are experiencing? She is not a wolf. You are confused. What are you talking about? She smiles at you then, as if she understands that too. Her eyes are too old for the body they look out of, and you wonder at how much she must have seen. I have missed you, she replies, so very much. So much more than a human should miss a childhood friend. I may not be a wolf, Bravan, but I feel this inside, too. Finally, you dare to take a step towards her. Her scent fills your nose as you move closer. It is so familiar, and it fills you as you allow it all to come back to you. Everything you had buried because of that day rises to the surface, and you remember clearly for the first time in years. You remember that morning when you had played together in the woods, when you had sat together in the sun, and Cecily had made you both rings made of grass stems. The feeling of contentedness, of being in exactly the right place, even if you had both been too young to know how important your games were. Reaching out, you wrap your fingers around Cecily's still outstretched hand. This close, you can smell the faintest traces of blood and you look at the daggers closely. Each lock of hair is bound by leather, sealed with a drop of the owner's blood. These are the old forms in full, a sign of vengeance of the most ancient kind. They are a step back to before wolves and hunters lived by the laws of the land and lived by their own codes alone. Any hunter or wolf would know them for what they were, and yet here they are in the hands of a young woman, barely more than a girl, who should have not known anything about them. How, you ask? Your grandfather, Cecily explains. My grandfather sees no one, you counter. I ran away when I was fourteen and went to him. He tried to run me off twice, she tells you, smiling fondly. But then I told him why I was there. He taught me everything I needed to know so I could become a hunter and hide in plain sight. Your grandfather is a one in a million, a lone wolf, never at peace in a pack. By all accounts, he met your grandmother, they had a wild, passionate affair that resulted in children, and then he left. You have only met him twice in your life, as he passed through pack lands, but you have always known where he lives. When you were young, you had thought him a very exciting person, and you remember telling Cecily all about him. Now, you cannot imagine how a wolf could exist without a pack. A human learning to hunt humans from a wolf. It sounds like a fairy tale. Are you real, you ask, because it is beginning to seem more and more like a dream? Of course I am, she replies, stepping closer so you are toe to toe. To the world I am red, licensed hunter. 
but on the inside I am Cecily, and I am a wolf. She is human. You sense it. You can smell it. And yet, as she declares herself a wolf, it makes your own animal shift inside you. Only an alpha's bite under the full moon can turn a human into a werewolf. And then it only works in a very few instances. No one, not human nor wolf, knows why. But in that moment you think you do. You believe her. Some humans are wolves on the inside and just need the bite to bring it to the outside. It is as simple as that. You know it at your very core as you look into Cecily's gaze. You knew it when you were children, and your wolf recognised your match, even though you were both too young to fully understand what that meant or what it could become. You know it now as you allow that part of you to wake again. Yes, she says, as you let your wolf rise to just below the surface. Like that. You can almost see the wolf fire reflecting back at you from her eyes. I am yours, you say, because it is the only thing that makes sense. And I am yours, Cecily replies. It is as if the years apart are irrelevant as you both speak the simple truth. Your parents were a mated pair, the alpha of a pack, Almost always is, and there were special gatherings every three years to find potential matches. You've been to a couple given that you are the eldest child of an alpha, but now you know why it always seemed so pointless. It occurs to you then that this is going to be hard to explain to your mother. However, your eyes slip to the daggers hanging from your clasped hands again, and it dawns on you, Cecily has done all the explaining you will ever need. Before the internet and the mobile phones, and cars even, wolves had ways for a potential mate to prove themselves if there was any doubt about the match. Cecily has proved herself in the most fundamental way possible, a rite of blood. There will be hoops to jump through questions to answer, but you have no doubt they will be simple formalities. Your mate comes to you having delivered vengeance and justice. No one will be able to argue with that. As this truth settles within you, for the first time you match Cecily's smile. I very much hope you enjoyed this little trip into werewolves and fairy tales. Thank you so much for joining me. Next week, we will be continuing the theme of horror and fairy tales with witches. Please, smash that like button if you enjoyed my story, and it would make me very happy if you would subscribe. It's totally free, and if you click the bell icon too, YouTube will let you know when I publish new vids. You'll never miss out on a story, and it will really help the channel. Thank you very much. There is an ebook version of the story on Amazon and all other major retailers if you would like a copy to keep. There is a link in the description, or scan the QR code on screen now. See you next week. As always, we'll have four YouTube shorts on Monday to Thursday, and another longer video on Friday. And now, something wholesome to send you on your way, as Ruby gives her daddy a wash. He was less than pleased she had fishy breath. <laughs>